my Juicy co-creators, Lilu here on the Juicy Living Tour in Kauai, Hawaii uh, with Grace. Hello. Hello, huh? <laughs> we just met today at the meetup because as you know, as I'm traveling around to all those amazing cities, islands and countries, I'm organizing some meetups. So wherever you are, whenever you see this video, um, know that you can go to the schedule of the tour and see when we're getting together, when the community is getting together because what I found out is that a lot of people around the world feel quite isolated and that's why they're enjoying so much the Juicy Living Tour videos and the website because then it's a reaffirmation. Not every place is like Kauai where it's like the whole family coming together and people are very much aligned. Even though in Kauai I felt that this was great, all of us coming together, sharing our stories and here I saw you like this diamond shining and I'm like there's something there for us to, to do and I just knew it and I don't know too much about your story but I just got what I call the green light I just knew that it has to happen that's my phrase <laughs> I wait for the green light and I don't do anything until it turns on even when it's amber it's not time and I've been beaconing you <laughs> wanting to connect and even though I asked you today are you still doing interviews I thought she'll invite me when it's her green light so mm -hmm. when you came up and said I got the green light you saw my eyes teared up yeah. Thank, yeah. you. Thank you. What were you moved by in that moment? What was the feeling? Here it comes again. That this is what I want to share today is um, a love story, and the probably the greatest moment of my life, yeah. and the call to love my beloved, and to serve him, and to have him serve me, and it transported me into my ascension. Yeah. And, and that, and I think it is uh, that story. You know it, but what I think you were moved by is 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 now to share it. You're ready. It has come to this place that I know this is a special thing for me, yeah. and to I, I have a governor that I need to be invited, and when someone else invites me that's what the tears were yeah. oh my god i've been incubating on this for two years i want to share this and you are the invitation so yeah. thank you so much uh, i feel so grateful <laughs> great and so we're going to talk about tiger paws tiger paws is your beloved dog that really turned out in this amazing life partner soul mate tell us tell us the whole story how did you meet him and how did it transform your life all the way to the ascension Mm -hmm. Well, um, this is a story about an ordinary girl and an ordinary dog, and it's also a very multidimensional story of being a star priestess, and he's a star dog, and also I know some people this isn't their belief, but he's been human, and he's been multidimensional, and we've traversed the universe together, and one time I actually asked a psychic, who are we to each other, even though I already knew, and she said, he's your escort through eternity. Mm and I didn't know I was looking for him uh, and at a certain time in my life when I was starting to really commune with the sense of family from other dimensions and was having um, meetings in the night uh, telepathically and this love would come that again would make me cry it's like okay this is what I'm alive for I have this love inside of me I'm here to share it and I like many of us ache for our home family, yeah. for our soul family. And they would come in the night and they'd say, we're coming, we're coming, but you have to hold your sovereignty. You have to know who you are. No gurus, no teachers, no helpers. This time you are claiming it all. And look for us, you'll see us in our eyes. You'll recognize us. And a year later, this dog showed up in my life and he had these eyes and he had this love. And the moment it impacted me, his love for me, I just, I came apart at the seams. It was just like, oh my God, you're the first. They promised me they'd come, and you're the first, and you're a dog. <laughs> and I just couldn't quite get my head around it, but I knew this love, and I knew those eyes. Yeah. And so I went on a journey with him for the last 12 years to discover why we were together and what was the purpose. And it ended up being that we'd agreed to do our ascension together. And so we've been helping each other over these last 12 years to finish what I call the journey of the wounded healer. Those of us that kind of sacrificed our own joy to come here and help Earth. Yeah. And we've been doing that together. And um, 
it's been a powerful, powerful story, and I'd like to tell you about the culmination of that and what that had to do with me coming here to Kauai. Yeah. Please do that and show us the picture of <laughs> Beloved. Yeah, it's not. It's a little dark. Yeah, no, we can see him. Oh, good. <laughs> it's my Beloved. How cute! He, isn't he gorgeous? I always wanted a gorgeous man in my life. <laughs> I wish I had a full picture of him. His He had a radiant golden coat. And golden every retri golden retriever. retriever. And they're considered the dolphins of the fur kingdom, that heart, mm -hmm. the golden heart. And he was definitely like a lion. And people would stop and get down on their knees on the concrete and say, can I just hug him? Can I just hug him? And they'd say, he's like a Buddha. He's the, and they would cry and he would heal them. And he just had this radiance about him and love. Just, well, you know what that's like when you meet someone that's just all love. Mm -hmm. So I felt honored to carry his leash. I uh, it yeah. just like he was the emissary. Whereas for us to go up and fully embrace with that deep, open-hearted love, not so easy. Mm -hmm. But because he was an animal and so gorgeous and so furry, he could do it. So, so, so you were you were single. How did this? I guess there was no other room for any other man uh, or partner to come in your no, life. There had been partners, and. Um, I tend to have karmic relationships where I'm meeting people that um, have been in my life before and I have very strong past life memory. So there's always a piece where the love is returning and then there's also something that we're working out with each other. So that's what happened with him. And yes, I was on my own and had lived in spiritual community for 15 years and had an incredible experience of love and brothers and sisters and two gurus. And At 17, huh, you yeah, started, started on your spiritual 17. journey. Yes. And by 20, I was living in an ashram. I was a celibate nun. I lived with 300 other people who were all serving God, and the world came to us. We became the most successful holistic health and yoga center in all of North America, and it was all based on our love. And it, so it was like a model community, and I got to experience that very, so young in my life that I just said, okay, my standard's very high. <laughs> And then I outgrew it. I learned how to access my own guidance, and I got that I don't need any teachers anymore, that I can have a direct relationship with the divine, and that felt normal to me. That felt more like who I am. And the guidance was, it's time to go. This has been your holy ground. You don't need it anymore. Go out and find me, God, in nature and in the world. And I got guided here. Hawaii. Yeah. Tell us what happened. Mm -hmm. When did, were you, how were you guided here? Uh, a guy came to take one of my programs. I was a teacher there, and he was from here and knew some people that I knew here, and it was an instant karmic connection. And he said, well, if you ever want to come to Kauai, you can come and see me. So I just went, okay, here we go. Yeah. And I got here, and the whole island just embraced me. And I meditated out at Limahuli Garden every day, and the island started speaking to me, and the ancient kahunas would come, and it was about reclaiming the divine feminine, and that's what this island is. It's truly the heart of the feminine. And I did that, and it felt like a big awakening, and I kind of saw a lot and knew how the world was going to change. And then Hurricane Aniki happened, and it closed down, and I went back out into the world. Which year was that, Aniki? 92. 92, mm -hmm. 1992. Mm. So then you went back to mainland? Mm -hmm. And what did you do there? I mean, what a change, because the island is a very different frequency. <laughs> very. But I actually was invited back to my um, yoga center, okay. and I was asked to start a, an executive center, because I'd been working with executives. <clears throat> and the main thing I do is I lead people in retreats. I work one-on-one -on, -one on the phone and in person, but the main thing I do is I help people come into sanctuary so that they can heal what's ever in the way for them to open up to their light and love. I've been doing that for forever. So I went back and started the leadership center and then that only lasted a little while. And then it was like, don't even do that. Just do your own thing. Go out in the world and do your own thing and follow your guidance. Mm -hmm. And so I did and I ended up in Seattle. And Great energy in Seattle, yeah. Yeah, and I'm just so connected to nature that... Um, It just drew me right in, and it felt, I'm from Canada, and where I was raised, um, the Great Lakes, up mm -hmm. in the beautiful, pristine Great Lakes, with just the rocks and the pines and the clear water, and that's what yeah. living in Seattle was like for me. It was so pure and beautiful and misty and green, yeah. and 
There's a mysticism too there. Very, absolutely. And the ETs come there all the time. <laughs> so I was living in a little cove all by myself, feeling pretty lonely and like, okay, I've done a whole lot already. I'm only in my 40s. What am I supposed to do? And what I got is uh, you are a multidimensional being and it's time for you to make contact with that level of your family and to help the world open to that. So I started to have these visitations, as I shared, and my star family came and they said, this partner's coming, this friend is coming. And he came as this dog. And when I met him, I, I just like, okay, I don't know, but he knew me. Uh -huh. He absolutely knew me. And, and once you, and you were explaining to me that he, he really literally jumped to you and he looked and you, your eyes connected your heart, your soul. And so from that moment onward, what happened with your whole spiritual journey and your life and being with him? Yeah. It all became about us. And people would say, you look, you act like a married couple. And we did. We had, and when I first felt his love for me and recognized that he was a soulmate, I started to tumble back through our past lives. And I remembered him in Tibet, and we were Tibetan monks together, and we would clear spaces. We would heal spaces. And I remembered him in the Pleiades, and he was my temple familiar. And he would protect me when I would go into trance. And it just, there was so much of that. And what started to happen is he, his wounds became revealed. And he, as beautiful as he was, he had a terribly hard, wounded self. And it was aggression with dogs. And he would fight them almost unto death. And it was so shocking. I was like, oh my God, you're my fluff ball and my love bug and everybody loves you and you're so holy and so pure. And then this aggression would come out. And it would trigger my fears of aggression and all my past life stuff about that. So I, I thought there's a call here, what is this? And I'm a healer, that's what I do. So I would go into meditation and I would ask for guidance and we would call in various different psychics and little bit by little bit, he let me know there's something bad in my background. And I don't know if I can even tell you, but I've chosen you to help me. Mm -hmm. You're the one soul in this world that I trust through time and I need you now. And he called me, he found me and said, please help me. And I certainly had my wounds, and yet I'd already done a whole lot of my work and was kind of ready to be done with the wounded identity. But it's almost like it wouldn't leave me. And I had done so much work over decades, and that's partly why I, I want to share today. So many of us already know who we are. We've remembered our source. We are connected to the divine, but that wounded trauma still lives in us. And it can feel so disheartening to say, it's like every intention in my bones is ready to be in my ascended self, but it pulls me back. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to share today about Tiger's experience of that and mine and how it was love that helped us through. Mm. Um, so love, 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 love. Yeah, <laughs> and that's my experience that if there is what we call darkness or contraction or whatever separation vibration, that it gets embedded really deeply down in our cellular memory. And it's global. It's not just us, but it's the collective unconscious. And now it's clear to me that Tiger and I came together to finish that. And that this love that we had and this seeing of each other, I knew who he was. And I would look in his eyes, and this was our meditation, I'd put my forehead to forehead, and I'd just say, I know you, I know who you are, I know who you are. And he would do the same with me. And that experience of being known, even when we were still stuck, and that's actually what I do with my clients, I see you. It's like the Avatar movie, mm -hmm, I see you. Mm -hmm. And for most of us, that's what we need when we're still a little bit stuck yeah. in the old stuff and we can't clear it to just know we're not invisible, we're not lost. And that that's, it's like, come on, you can do this, you can come across, you can get mm -hmm. this off of you. So what I really wanted to share today was Tiger's story. And w what gradually got revealed is that he was so ashamed of what had happened that it, he didn't know if he could share. And uh, all these healers came into our life. All these people that had all these different modalities showed up everywhere we moved together. And this one person had a machine where he could put Tiger's hair on it, fur on it, and it would show wherever the wounds were. Cellular, biological, belief systems, past lives, this time. And then it, the machine would clear it. 
clear it, clear it, clear it, clear it, clear it, if the soul was in agreement. And everything cleared. Tiger had huge health issues. His health would collapse like crazy, and he'd almost die. And then he had this aggression problem. So everything cleared. And then one thing, and the man looked at me, he said, there's one lifetime, and it just won't clear. I've run it six times. And I said, what is it? And he said, it's 17th century France. And something in his soul is stuck there. So I went home, and I told him, and we had a completely telepathic relationship. And I said, what is it? And I could just feel him crying inside. And he said, I don't know if I can talk about it, but I gradually just got him to. And he told me the story of what had happened to him. And it was that he was a priest, and that he was totally in his God love, and he was radiant. He was as benevolent as he was here. And he was before his time. That wasn't his greatest, I mean, he was an avatar already. And he fell in love with a woman. But at that time, that wasn't allowed. Mm. And the church found out, and the community found out, and they excommunicated him, and all of the collective hate towards his sin was projected onto him. And even though he knew it wasn't wrong, um, he went off with his beloved, and they kicked him out of the community, and he tried to hold on to himself, and he couldn't. Mm. And I, this has happened to so many of us, I know it has, that the collective unowned wound, the shame, the hate, the rejection of some part of us gets projected and we it's hard to hold on to our connection with who we are. And he became an alcoholic and he dry, died in a drunken stupor and took it all in. And when he was sharing this with me, he said, so what so is, it's my animal nature that's sinful and I'm punishing myself by being an animal and I don't deserve to be human, and I don't deserve to be loved by God. And that's what's broken in me, and I need your help to heal this, because I can't get through it myself. And even though he was this radiant golden retriever who had completely that God love in him, he couldn't heal, and it was all in his physical health, and then he was acting it out on other dogs, because he couldn't quite mm -hmm. own it himself. And this is the work I do with humans. This is the level of... Yeah. But I've never done this with an animal before, and um, I just had to trust him. And I had to trust myself that this wasn't some kind of crazy story that I was making up. And I just thought, I love you, you love me, I'm going to go with this. And we kept moving and being guided to different places, and the right healer would be there mm -hmm. to work with him in some modality. And I would work with him, and I'd do a lot of surrogate where I would feel it inside of my body and feel the belief and then I would clear it myself, uh -huh. and whatever ailment he had, it would heal. So it, it, you were 100% devoted to totally. this soul. Totally, and him to me. And I, I, so how, when did it start to really unfold? I mean, I guess love was always present in his communication and devotion towards each other and healing, and more love was present. And more and more love until yeah. ascension? Well, he would go into these crises where either there'd be a horrible dog fight or his health would collapse. And then I would get triggered myself and all my past life memories would come up. And then I would work with him and we would go back to the vet. The worst thing happened, he got Lyme's disease. And they couldn't clear it and they couldn't clear it. And she was telepathic mm -hmm. and all the medicine and everything. And she finally got down. She said, there's one belief left. And we tapped for it and got it, and it was that he didn't believe he deserved God's love. So I worked with him, and we tapped some more, and I imprinted it for him. And he, this is hard to believe, but he leaned back on his back haunches. He put his hands up on her forearm. I was right beside her, and he put his paws together like this. And because we were giving him, you, I deserve love. I yeah. deserve God's love. It's, it's time for me to receive God's love. And she tested him again, and the limes cleared. And all the medicine in the world couldn't, couldn't do it. And then that happened, and then two or three years later, he got it back, and it had penetrated his brain. Do you think that at the same time, then, while you were living this through him also, that you were healing your own journey, exactly. the, 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 like he was a mirror somewhat of your own? Absolutely, because I have my thing that I couldn't finish, that I now understand, was a bond that was called love bound to aggression, and it's in my intimate circle. Yeah. And um, so we were doing this tandem ride that I, all my 
difficulties have been in my core relationships and then my finances. And as much as I know how to do this work, I've done it for 40 years, it would not clear. Yeah. And so every time he'd go through something, it would bring it up for me. So I'd work on him, he'd clear, and then I'd go in my room and do myself. And he'd lay by my side and I would cry and I would be in the bed for hours and he wouldn't move. He was just like the Sphinx. He guarded me, he took care of me, he waited for me, he'd give up his walks. And to be held like that was just incredible. And then we'd go off and do our fun times and our play times. Yeah, so how do you define soulmate? What is a soulmate? I feel like it's any soul that we have this depth of contract with. Sometimes it can be a very fleeting moment that we interact for one tiny little moment to say, hey, I see you, I remember you. And sometimes it's like this, it's life changing. But any soul that there's that kind of agreement. And often of them are very deeply conflicted. Like we fought terribly. He would trigger me and I'd trigger him and he'd get sick of me and I'd get sick of him. It's not an easy relationship mm -hmm. to undo karma together because mm -hmm. you're triggering each other so much. But that's my work, I'm a relationship counselor, so I stuck it out. And when I watched that he, I mean, when you try to share, well, I had this cosmic shift and I feel better and I know I'm God now, that's nice. But when I would see his health actually change, yeah. you know, that was v visible evidence that something was happening. But there would still be these collapses, and we would work with it and work with it, both in myself and with him. And then there came a period where he was getting older, and I got, it's time now. We need to finish this. And everything built up around us. All the events of the universe came together to uh, help us get it done, basically. And I knew what mine was to break this bond of love and aggression, really, in my family. And I made a, an investment. I just made a commitment that I was going to put all my money, all my time. I stopped work, and I went into deep sanctuary, and he was holding space for me. And then I would work with him, and it got more and more intense as I came right to the center point of where the stuckness was in my consciousness. And the challenges that came were just incredible. And I know what that is. I'm an alchemist, and I know that once you declare that you are of the light, everything that's bound up in separation is going to come for you. So he got sicker, <clears throat> and I got more difficulty in my life, and we made this pact with each other. And I said, okay, this is it. We're going through. We're going to go through the portal of death, and we're going to come out in heaven. And I said, are you ready? And he said, yes. And the guidance was, then you need to go back to Toronto, because that's where it's all bound up for me. That's where I'm from. Mm -hmm. And he was old, he had a beautiful health care system in Victoria. I went, Tiger, how can I take you away from here for this one last walk into the fire pit? And he said, you know I'm going with you. I have to go, I have to put you in the hands of the one that comes after me. And so we left, and he was all old and rickety and could hardly take care of himself. And we got to Toronto, and the flare-up of both relationship stuff in my family and both and psychic intensity and we just every day said okay walk it down walk it down stare at it he got really sick i started to feel very challenged and our that was our meditation every day we're going to do this together we are going through the portal of death and we're coming out on the other side and we're going to live in heaven on earth together and so we worked it every single day and then he started to die and it was exactly two years ago right now and I thought, oh God, I've got to put him down. We're in the city. We don't have a health care system. We live in this tiny little apartment on the 17th floor. I don't know how to do this. And he just came to me, and I called the vet, and I said, can you come? Can you come to our house? Can we do a nice ceremony? Will you just put him down? And he went frantic. He went utterly and completely just panting and clawing at the door and wouldn't come in the house. And, and then he just started pounding at me, no needles, no needles, no needles. I died in a stupor in that lifetime. I've got to go consciously because I'm breaking this spell. I bought all that stuff back then, and I'm going out through this health issue and this aggression issue, and I'm going to do it consciously, no needles. And I thought, you can't ask this of me. A great big, huge dog that's going to stop being able to hold himself and care for himself in the city. And he just said, I ask you. And my experience is, is that that's sometimes the greatest thing we can do in relationship is dare to ask the one that we love 
please walk with me through I choose this for myself I choose to break free you don't have to fix it for me you don't have to take it away from me trust me I know what I'm doing but walk with me and I was completely like oh god don't make me do this don't make me watch you fall apart basically and have to let you go and be your facilitator and I realized Lilu that that's what I've been asking for it's like show up don't fix it you don't need to do anything I know what I'm doing just be walk by my side while I ascend while I go through death and come out the other side and I just honor all of you who have ever done that for a loved one because it's the most courageous thing and it's the greatest gift of love so I said okay we'll do it so it yeah and then there is the uh, the grieving process still afterwards not even after during I had to be there for him um, I said, okay. I called the vet. I said, what's going to happen? And she said, well, his organs are all going to shut down and he's not going to be able to go outside. And, da, 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 da. and I said, is this okay? And she said, if you trust him and you trust yourself, you do what's right for you. And they gave me a few little medical tips, but basically we were on our own. And a lot of the time, because the guidance kept coming, trust this, trust this, this is your call to your master. You've always known that you were a goddess in this dog is asking you to claim all your power and trust your guidance you've lived by guidance your whole life now you've got to really rely on it because your beloved's going down and nobody's here to help and whatever he says you got to trust that it's accurate and whatever you're getting inside you got to trust that it's accurate and so he did he started to fall apart and he couldn't eat anymore and I carried him outside and people would come from nowhere to help animal lovers and say oh no it's happening he's dying isn't he and good for you and do it your own way and and go for it and they'd kiss him and say goodbye to him and, and day after day it was and then I couldn't I, I would cry sometimes in front of him but I just felt like he was in such a vulnerable place and I went out in the woods and just sobbed and thought I can't do this I can't let you go I'm too attached and then I would and I was crying in my bed and then I saw this apparition behind me and he was out in the hallway, and it was like a little teddy bear in a way. And he said, why are you crying over that bag of bones? I'm hardly in there anymore. I'm already on my way out. And I thought, okay, he's all right. I'm having trouble with this. I'm the one that feels like I'm losing him. I'm watching his suffering. And he sat in that hallway like a sphinx for two weeks. He hardly moved, except when I carried him outside. And I don't know what kind of pain he must have been in. And as it got closer and closer to the end he just seemed to linger and linger and I thought what's he doing what's he doing and he said I'm savoring the love I've accepted God's love I'm savoring the love just give me a little time and so more days and more days and he was getting so weak and he couldn't even go outside anymore and it got down to the final weekend and I got tired I just got tired and I thought I've got to do something to help him with his pain even though he said let me do it on my own and I called the vet and I said can I have some pain medicine and she said well we can give these syringes through the mouth that's morphine basically and I went into prayer and they said just one just one little shot and I asked him and I got yes and we did ceremony around it and I gave him one and then I gave him two and then I gave him three and I just got caught in I have to do something to fix this for you the very thing that I believe isn't necessary I got caught there and he almost was drugged and he fought himself back he actually just started to lift his head and breathe and pant and breathe and pant and I called one of my dog friends who's an intuitive and she said he's fighting he doesn't want to go out in a stupor he asked this one thing of you and you just about got in the way and even though I'm his loved one and even though I wanted to do it perfect and he clawed and clawed and came back. I opened all the windows and doors and he was there for another few or four hours and there was still one catch and he said, I can't go yet. And there was w one more piece and it was something about, I'm not alone. There's, n there's never any aloneness. And I did some tapping and imprinted that for him and he went into this deep restful place and I laid down beside him and he was hardly breathing at that point and I was almost falling asleep and I felt this presence come and it was his face from when he was the priest and he said I've done it I'm free yeah. I broke the spell and he just went like that and he fell over and he was gone and I just knew <laughs> it's like that's what he wanted from me mm -hmm. and even though I almost messed it up he got what he <laughs> wanted 
you know, he intended to go out consciously, and he went out on the octave of there's no such thing of being alone. No matter what they put on you, no matter how deeply you fall into a fall of gra uh, from grace, I'm not alone. I'm one with my God. And he went out on that octave, and then he didn't leave. And then he said, okay, now your turn. We're doing this together, remember, we promised. Uh -huh. And he stayed, he was dead, but his spirit was there. And all night he stayed with me and he said, now you do it, stare down your own hurt, your own wound, and mine is a sense of betrayal that my loved ones turn on me. And he said, just stare it down. And I went through every lifetime and it came out of my body. And in the morning he said, okay, I gotta go, I gotta go, I'm done here. And he just, like Mighty Mouse, just shh. <laughs> And every time I tried to track him, he said, I've just gone, I've gone to the place beyond, beyond, I'm resting. And within a month, I was on a plane, and my friend here, who was one of my helpers through all of that, she said, you've got to rest now, just come. And I came here, and, In paradise. and Tiger said, I've gone to heaven, you go to paradise, thank you for your help. And... I, when I felt what I did with him, I didn't ever know if I could really do it, if I could walk my talk that deeply and be everything that I say that I am. And I couldn't have done it if he hadn't asked it of me. Yeah. And even though I was imperfect, I just still did it. And it turned something on in me, Lulu, where I lost my self-doubt. And I lost my dependency on anyone having to take care of me. And since I, mm -hmm. go ahead. I was gonna ask, so do you now feel complete in your life even though if he's not here with him do you feel h how do you feel right now without two years later without him being here but knowing that you have done this for your soul his soul there's both there's like I miss him like crazy and I'm finding it very challenging walking by myself even though I know this was the ascension this was us we dropped it we dropped the veil we dropped mm -hmm. the separation and I can feel it I feel free that thing that I had carried for a thousand lifetimes it's gone mm -hmm. and it's gone for him so the success and the completion and the love story that ended well is so great that on that level I'm so happy for him that that wanting to have him back just doesn't kind of arise, but I still miss him. Mm -hmm. We were so close. And the main thing I'm discovering is it doesn't all happen at once. There's been lots of wobble back and forth for me. And there's been a whole another two years of me needing to adjust. And sometimes I think it would be easier to do it without a body. Like he seems like, got it, yeah. he's done, he's fine. And down here with a body, with emotions, with memory, I, the backsliding and the sense of, oh, I still hurt, I still remember all those old things. So the practice now is to really claim it, to really, we were talking at the meeting today, that the grid is intact here in Kauai. There's nothing broken about the multidimensional grid here. Mm -hmm. And that's what those of us that have gone through these deaths and through these adjustments, that's the feeling I have now that this quiet time of just being here, I would just work very part-time, very quiet, to walk completely in my union with God now and get used to it and enjoy it. We've all worked so damn hard and it's all been kind of challenging <laughs> that getting used to it being easy and I don't touch anything anymore and it all comes by grace. My clients have rebuilt up, my money's built back up again. But I'm doing it alone. Uh, nobody's helping. It's, I'm not. And not it. really alone. No, but that's what I mean. <laughs> yeah. And it's really about once we've asked for it, once we've claimed it, the guidance has come. You're married to the divine now. This is the marriage you waited for. He was your soulmate that helped you get here. But this is truly, and it is a walk of autonomy and independence for me. And that I don't really need anybody anymore. So I don't even need Tiger in a way. Yeah. And he's kind of hinted that he's going to come back. Yeah, or maybe in the form of a man that nice comes in your life. And He'll point this out. I was walking in Princeville, and I was missing him. And I heard, what would it be like if he came back as a man? And oh my God, my heart just exploded. Yeah. And I started to get all attached, and it's like, come now, come now. But that I have to let go of. And to just be now, to just be here, this is the state of freedom and it's working, and I have to be a little careful because it's easy to slide back and to kind of get tangled back in some old ways of relating. And it feels sometimes a little lonely. It feels like the people that I love are not there, 
and I can't really relate to them about any of this, but there's all of us. There's all of the rest of us. There's a lot of co-creators. A lot. A, a lot, lot are coming to the island, and there's a lot of wonderful people to hear and all over the world, exactly. And that's why I'm so grateful, because we can't all be together. Like, my soul family are not here. They're off in different places in the world. And to get used to that, that we have a divine family, and that for me anyway, and I imagine this is, a lot of the clients that I'm working with are very, very powerful people, but they're not used to holding their light completely themselves yet. They still think they need a relationship, or they need a career, or they need money in the bank, or, and yes, those things are all necessary, and they come, but they come to the degree that we can really integrate this crystalline grid mm -hmm. that the kids are coming in with. So that's what I'm doing now is helping myself and helping others really settle into it can be fun, it can be easy, it can be joyful, and just learn to play again. So here's the, this is the perfect place. And then I know there's other chapters. I know I'm born a teacher. I know I'm supposed to share in big global ways. But for now, it doesn't matter. Well, we're going global now. <laughs> yes, we are. And I've been feeling this nudge. How is this going to happen? Am I supposed to set up a website? I've got a book that I'm writing. But I do best like this. I do best in one-on-one -on -one and actually talking. And I've been praying, God, just give me the opportunity to share this yeah. and to invite others that are in that place where they've been so intentional about releasing that old, but they're just stuck. And my message today is that on some level, it's about connecting with love doesn't mean a beloved, but it's like when we know that we're held in love, we can do anything, even stare down death. And that's what this showed me. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Grace. Thank you. <laughs> we send you much grace and love from Kauai. And thank you for listening. And thank you for sharing this video with people that you think will relate and, and they can help. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Aloha. <laughs>